Hello, everyone. We'll get started here in a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Yes, and good afternoon to you too. All right, I'm going to uh, get started because uh, we have a good amount of stuff to get through. Um, if someone in the chat could uh, let me know if you can hear me, uh, that would be great just to make sure that. Awesome. Thank you so much for confirming that. Wonderful. Um, Yes, yeah, so thank you so much everyone for joining our Mighty Cause webinar, Raise Your Game and Boost Your Online Spring Fundraising. I'm really excited to talk through some really great tips that we have for spring fundraising for you this year. Uh, my name is Lisa. I'm the Senior Community Engagement Manager here at Mighty Cause. Uh, and so for today, we're going to be covering some three specific areas in particular. So one is how you can incorporate gamification into your spring fundraising campaign, how you can emphasize recurring giving this year in your spring campaign, how you can leverage matching grants. And then at the end, we'll be going through any questions that anyone has. There is a question section of your Zoom panel. So as this webinar goes on, feel free to ask your questions in the control panel, and then I'll get to them at the end. Um, but as well, if you want to wait to add them at the end, you can do so as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So we're going to talk about the first topic, which is incorporate gamification. Why and how should you incorporate gamification? So some of you may be familiar with this idea of gamification, um, but for those of you who are not familiar, gamification is the application of taking a game-like designer strategy to non-game contexts, such as donating and fundraising. So it's this idea of taking this idea of gamification, game-like things, and applying it to fundraising. So why is this something that you should be interested? Why should your nonprofit consider introducing this sort of application to your fundraising? Well, gamification has been around for several years. And in a 2017 study, it found that millennials view gamification as a viable approach to encourage charitable giving. In the same study, it found that Millennials in particular, one of the most important things that they found when it came to giving was understanding uh, transparency of where their donation was going, and as well understanding how a nonprofit operates, and that gamification was a great approach into providing that information, and we'll get into how you can do that in a second. So overall, gamification provides increased engagement with your donors or your participants if you're doing a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. It can help create an environment where there is a healthy competition. And overall, it makes it more fun. The idea of gamification, right, when you're applying a game idea to non-game environment is you want to make it a more friendly approach. You want to make it a more fun environment and just a different way as to how you can communicate with your donors. All right. So one very common example of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is, a, a, oops, sorry, the mouse got in the way. Um, so one common example of gamification is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So what is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising for those of you who are not familiar, that you're new to the landscape? So peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is the idea of your support network, um, fundraising for your organization. So they're reaching out to their network of people and having them donate to their fundraiser, which supports your organization. 
So in general, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is a really great way for people in your network to engage with your organization in a different way. It's a different ask than, can you make a donation? Um, and it provides friendly competition. And I'll show you in a second, um, Teams and Events, which is a tool available on Mighty Cause that provides the ability to create that friendly competition. As I mentioned, with peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, the idea of someone in your network fundraising for your organization um, is that it really helps with donor acquisition. Um, so they are reaching out to a network of people that you may not have had contact with before, uh, their colleagues, their family members, et cetera. These are new donors that your organization can acquire that maybe you wouldn't have been able to previously. One thing I should note about a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer fundraising is that it does require more upfront effort. It does require you to find and look for people who can participate in a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser, but the people who can participate really can be anyone. It can be your staff. It can be your board members. That's a very common peer-to-peer -peer challenge, which is a board member challenge. It can be your volunteers, family members, friends, or in general, anyone who is connected to your nonprofit in a different way. So uh, one of the things I mentioned in the last slide is something that Mighty Cause offers is teams and events. Uh, and I'm going to do a quick run rundown for those of you who are planning on peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Uh, because teams and events, those are obviously very broad terms. So it's helpful to understand how we at Mighty Cause utilize those terms and um, what those tools mean. So teams on Mighty Cause is a fundraising page that's really ideal for a group of individuals that want to raise money for a specific nonprofit. So as the example I shared previously, a board challenge, that's a really great example of when you would utilize a team. So it'd be each individual. So in the case of a board challenge would have their own fundraising page, and that would be connected to an overall team landing page. So your board members group challenge, and then each board member would have their own fundraising page that um, represents themselves. So it's really perfect for smaller groups that are looking to fundraise together. And it also provides you a leaderboard so you can have that competitive aspect of uh, seeing how much your other board members have raised or see how much your other people in your network have raised, et cetera. So events would be ideal if you're doing a larger scale peer to peer. It's if you need teams and individuals incorporated together. What I mean by that, um, a really great example is maybe a school. Uh, you have your overall school challenge and then maybe you need teams of different grades. And then within each grade, each student has their own fundraising page. So it's really ideal if you have, again, a larger scale peer to peer fundraising campaign. Um, it also allows for participant registration and ticket sales if you're doing Eventbrite. Um, and it provides you a just, a just additional some tools that would be helpful if you are doing something of a larger scale, like a sponsorship section, um, et cetera. So that's just a brief, quick rundown of teams versus events. So, so a really common example of gamification are leaderboards. So leaderboards create a sense of urgency, they build excitement and competitiveness, and they overall increase engagement with your participants and your donors. Um, and leaderboards are available in teams and events as I um, listed out previously. So if you are planning on creating a leaderboard for your organization, one really great way of introducing gamification is by adding leaderboard incentive and prizes. Reward your participants with a tangible gift. So as I mentioned, if you are asking people to participate in a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that requires a lot of work, but it is something that people have to opt in and put a little bit of time into. And so by providing them a reward or a tangible gift uh, for participating or for winning a challenge, um, that's a really great way to motivate your participants to build engagement and to also create content, um, user content on social media, et cetera. So just some, uh, a bit of examples for leaderboard challenges that you can think of if you are planning on utilizing a leaderboard. 
You can stick to the standard unique donors and dollars raised. Our leaderboards allow for you to rank based off um, total donors or dollars raised. If you don't want it to be so competitive on your leaderboards, you can rank them by name. But if you want to think a little bit outside the box, you could create a storytelling prize. So maybe the top teams or participants with the best fundraising page win a, a specific prize. And we'll talk about prizes in a second. Um, so I saw a really great example of an event incorporating this idea. And it was really awesome to see the participant pages when there was the storytelling prize uh, because their pages were just so beautifully done. There were amazing images, awesome stories. Uh, and then for the storytelling prize, they had a group of judges then judge the um, submitted pages. Um, and it was a really great way of just having people participate in your campaign that is a little bit different than most dollars raised or most donors. Social media prize. So again, thinking outside of the box, maybe it's the top teams or participants with the best social media or social media post for your campaign. Or think about how you can incorporate the theme of your campaign into a prize. So let's say you're running a dogathon. Maybe it's uh, participants have to submit their best dog photos and you'll have a group of judges judge what's, what's the best dog photo and the winners get posted onto your website or social media shout out or can receive a specific prize. Uh, there's also a really great example from the platform. Um, there was a, uh, an event where it was a funny pants uh, competition. So each participant had their own pair of pants that were funny looking. And um, at the end of their fundraising campaign, they had a fashion show to show off all of their funny pants that they each participant was representing. So just an idea of how you can think through challenges. And if you're not planning on doing a leaderboard, there are ways of incorporating challenges if you aren't planning on doing a peer-to-peer. -peer. And I'll share an example with you in a second. So some examples of leaderboard prizes as well. So prizes can be broken down into high value and low value, and they don't have to be something that is over the top, expensive. Um, you, it can be something as simple as coffee with your executive director. As I mentioned in that study that I referenced from 2017, one of the things that millennials in particular really interested in was transparency of where a donation was going to and how a organization operated. So that could be one example of a prize you provide or a social media newsletter shout out. And if you wanted to provide a tangible gift, it could be maybe a sticker or a t-shirt from your organization. If you're planning a raffle, it could be a raffle ticket or it could be a gift basket or gift card to local vendor. Um, maybe you wanna take out winners to um, an ice cream party. The world is your oyster and you can see that it doesn't have to be something tangible, but if you want it to be, that's a really great motivator for participants. So as I mentioned, uh, you can incorporate this challenge idea in a non-leaderboard sense. So this is a really great example of an organization. Uh, they ran a campaign called Call for Artists and Donors. So this challenge was uh, they are a uh, organization that rescues sloths in particular and different animals. Um, and they had different artists, um, regardless of age, uh, send in their, um, their artwork representing an animal that they rescue or their organization. Uh, each of these, uh, each artwork was listed on their fundraising page. And then as donors uh, donated, they were able to vote throughout the checkout flow, which artwork they liked the most. And then the winner was, uh, had their design printed on a t-shirt that then donors could purchase at the end of the campaign. So this is a really great example where it's not necessarily people creating fundraising pages for your organization, but you're getting people involved in a challenge. They're voting for their favorite artwork. There's a tangible prize at the end for the winner that there's a t-shirt that's gonna be printed out that donors can purchase at the end. Uh, so this is just another really great example of how you can, again, incorporate that gamification, the challenge, the incentives 
into a fundraising campaign. Another great way of incorporating this idea is with live streaming. So over the past two years, obviously many live events have migrated to virtual and live streaming brings the essence of live events to virtual without sacrificing that donor or participant engagement. It allows you to still be connected with your donors or participants. And also it broadens the scope of your campaign because if you had a live event previously, uh, you know, you're really the people who could attend were really the people that were locally based, but now it can be anyone can participate. So maybe it's family members of people that are participating, or maybe it's, you know, donors across the country that support your organization and your cause. Um, so it really helps broaden the scope of your campaign. So when you're thinking about live streaming, a YouTube video or Vimeo or Facebook are really great platforms to set up a live stream. You can make a live stream pre-recorded or live and work with what is comfortable for you. Um, so if you are someone who you don't think that you're comfortable in a live environment or you're not really sure of what you want to uh, have planned out in a live environment, and think about recording a message and think through about then what you want pre-recorded. Um, and we'll talk about some things that you can add in there as well. Um, so use YouTube and Facebook in particular allow for chat. So this is a really great way to engage with your donors or participants um, and have them involved again in the process, especially if it's a hybrid event. And it doesn't have to be something that's incredibly professional. Um, I think some when people think of live stream, some people think that you have to be in a studio environment with professional cameras and videos and lighting. And that's not the case at all. You don't need to have it be in a professional environment. Obviously, it's really good to have good lighting um, and to have a camera that, you know, can provide, you know, in general, a quality image, but nothing that, you know, an iPhone can't do. So uh, just some easy tips about live streaming for you. So when you're thinking about, well, what should I exactly live stream? I like the idea, but I don't really know what I would really share with my participants or with my donors. So one is to think about creating an opening or closing ceremony for your campaign. Um, and I'll show you a really great example of that in a second. Um, so this could be a really great way of getting people excited for the start of your campaign or share the results for the closing of your campaign. Um, it can be just a message from your executive director. So again, this could be an example of a pre-recorded thing. Maybe you want to just share in a different way the mission of your spring fundraising campaign. What are you raising money for? Why is it important for people to donate now as opposed to later in the year? You can feature an impact story. So again, this is also something that you can do live or pre-recorded. Um, so this could be someone who's benefited from your organization. This could be a specific project that you've completed because of a previous campaign or a project that you're looking to complete with your campaign. Maybe it's a fashion show, as I mentioned with the funny pants example. Maybe uh, if you're doing a fashion show or some sort of um, gala or you know raffle event, maybe you wanna live stream that uh, for your people who cannot attend. Um, and as I mentioned, just think about the overall theme of your campaign and how you can incorporate that into a live stream. You know, maybe if you're doing a dogathon, uh, you have a pre recorded video of different dogs that you're raising money for. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can introduce this into your spring fundraising campaign. So one additional uh, benefit of live streaming is that you can make live streaming a viewing party. So for those who cannot make it, uh, you can create them a party packet and invite them to share on social media what they're doing at home. Um, there was an event previously that uh, due to COVID, they became um, virtual one year. Uh, they were um, a uh, an event where 
people would stay in shelters for the night um, and typically it would be at uh, the dog shelters in person. But when it came virtual, people shared uh, their photos and videos of their dog with themselves with their dogs at home. So think through of how you can invite people to participate in your campaign this year. So if you are using a Mighty Cause fundraising page, you can actually uh, add your live stream to Mighty Cause. So if you are at creating it through Facebook, Vimeo, or YouTube, you can simply add your live stream as a cover image or as a description. Um, and users, if they go to your fundraising page, they'll be able to watch the live stream and make a donation as well. So you can um, really make sure that you are providing access to that stream wherever a donor goes and can easily make a donation. So as an example of um, live streaming, this is also the Toucan Rescue Ranch. Um, this year they had their sixth annual Sloth Ironman Games. Um, and so for this year, uh, they had a live stream where they shared an announcement of all of the sloths that were participating in their challenge. Um, so this is a really great example of utilizing that opening and closing ceremony idea. Um, and as you see here, they kind of broke down as well the different days of each event and then uh, the days of when people could participate in their live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, so just another different way of you can, it doesn't have to be a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign, but a different way that you can incorporate live streaming to your fundraising campaign. Another way of introducing gamification to your spring fundraising campaign is text to give text to give empowers anyone with a smartphone to give using their mobile phone. So text to give is really convenient for donors. It's not complicated for them to create and it's not location specific. So if you are doing an in-person event or you are doing a hybrid event and you are having a place where donors are going to be, they're going to want to make a donation, text to give is a really great tool for that uh, because instead of having to find a computer or having an iPad and then there is a line and people have to wait to give a donation, um, you can have a keyword and people just write on their mobile device use the keyword and then start making their donation. So as I mentioned, text to give is really easy to also implement. So you would just set up the keyword that you want. So if you're, let's say you're doing dogathon, it could be dogathon 2022, or it could be something um, smaller if you want it to be that way. Donors would text your keyword to this number, 844-844-6844, and then they can complete their donation right there. They'll, be re they'll receive a text message directing them where they can go donate, and they can go and make their donation. So again, it's really helpful and useful um, in the context of if you are having a lot of donors in a place and there's just, you want an easy way for them to use their mobile device to make a donation. So that was a little bit about uh, how you can incorporate gamification to your spring fundraising campaign. We're now gonna be talking about recurring giving and how you can emphasize that for your spring fundraising campaign. So recurring giving programs and recurring giving donors are really the champions of your nonprofit. They are essential to organizations because they provide a steady income that you can rely on. And in the long-term recurring giving programs, they create higher retention overall because they're more lo loyal donors. And as I mentioned, it's overall income that you know that's coming to your nonprofit. In 2021, uh, online monthly giving revenue grew by 40%. So this isn't something that's going away. It's something that is growing. And in particular, while, we'll while we're still talking about millennials, um, according to the Millennial Impact Report, it found that 52% of millennials are interested in monthly giving as a means to give back in a meaningful way. As I mentioned also in that study, couple slides back from 2017, 
Uh, it mentioned that millennials, one of the most important things for them was understanding the transparency of where their donation was going to and understanding of how an organization operates. Um, obviously that study was for millennials, but that doesn't necessarily really hold just to millennials. You could say that, I would say regardless of generation that those are really important aspects uh, that donors are looking for. And recurring giving actually provides you a really great avenue to provide that information to donors. So spring is actually a really great time to emphasize recurring giving because it provides the perfect imagery for recurring giving. This is the time to use language like plan to seed, make your donation grow. This is the time where they can make a recurring giving and then you can update them or show them how their donation has affected your organization in three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, a year, two years, et cetera. So it's a really great opportunity to share that messaging uh, for donors instead of waiting them to start something like that on Giving Tuesday. So one way of really sharing the impact of uh, recurring giving and to also motivate donors to give monthly is uh, creating language through your donation levels and descriptions. Um, so when donors go to make a donation, this is going to be probably the most impactful for them. Um, so it's really important to share how their donation can make a tangible impact to your organization. So as these examples show, uh, $20 can provide food supplements to 16 children. Uh, $10 provides one book to a child in need. Um, if you don't have something that is necessarily, maybe you're a theater organization, $15 um, sponsors one storytelling event that our organization plans to host. Or, you know, you can think really outside of the box as to how you want to kind of provide that information to donors, because this is a really powerful tool as to how much uh, of a commitment they're going to make. One thing that's also really important to consider is that, um, you know, since 2020, there's been a significant increase in new donors that are making uh, first-time donations um, and they're making small first-time donations. So although it would be amazing if we would receive all of our recurring donors signing up for $100 a month, also think about the person that can only give five, 10, $15 or $20 a month. Um, and again, sharing that impact for them as to what their $5 can do to support their organization. Um, this is obviously on the checkout flow, but if there's any other images or descriptions you wanna add to your campaign or your website, that's definitely very effective um, and can provide the messaging even more clear to your donors. So as you're thinking about also recurring giving um, or running a recurring giving campaign or emphasizing that for your spring fundraising, one thing to utilize on Mighty Cause is your donor retention report uh, because donors who have given before are more likely to give again. Um, again, you don't wanna, don't necessarily need to wait for the end of the year to reach out to these donors. Um, so your donor retention report is available on your Mighty Cause dashboard, and it can provide you a list of donors that have donated from Mighty Cause last year and ones that you have retained or have not retained. So if this is your first year using Mighty Cause, we wouldn't have this data yet, but something that you can utilize next year for yourself. But this is a really great tool um, into figuring out the people that you should be targeting for your spring fundraising campaign. Who are people that donated last year, but they haven't made a donation yet? Um, and what's really great is then by the end of the year, if you've seen that, you know, so-and-so people haven't donated still towards your campaign, you know the touch points you've already made with those people already. So this is definitely a great tool to utilize um, and to, reach out to these individuals who haven't donated to your organization again, and then sharing the mission and what you are trying to raise money for and the impact of your organization. So what's really also important about recurring 
uh, giving and re recurring um, giving programs in general is the follow up. Um, it's really easy to forget about it because these donors stay on as, you know, donors for your organization. But consider of how you can thank them for setting up a recurring donor. Maybe it's doing a shout out on social media, newsletter. If you're planning on doing a live stream, maybe at the end of your campaign, you shout out all, all the donors that have set up a monthly donation. Uh, utilize the spring imagery throughout the rest of the year. Um, so as I mentioned, plan to seed, make your donation grow. That's really great imagery to start at. And then throughout the year, you can, you can continue with that imagery and you can share, this is how much your donation has grown or how much has impacted us. This is how much, you know, we've been able to raise or um, create through your uh, support. Uh, and so this is also just in general an important thing to do, which is just to uh, make sure that you are staying engaged with your recurring donors. Uh, you wanna make sure that they are up to date as to the impact that they're making and uh, you know how much their donation has um, provided support for your organization. So another avenue of just how you can communicate and share with them. All right, so now that we've covered recurring giving, um, we're gonna talk about uh, how you can leverage matching grants for your spring fundraising campaign. So for those of you who are not familiar with matching grants, matching grants is a fundraising tool that is used as a donation incentive. So it provides the ability for donors to make their donation count more during a specific time period uh, because a match is being offered uh, at that time. So how matching grants can boost your spring fundraising campaign. So one, a match provides an incentive. It's a really great way to strategically drive people to give. Um, their donation donors know that their donation is gonna make a larger impact with a match. It creates a sense of urgency so it's a built-in time limit and it creates that urgency that donors need to make their donation now as, a, as opposed to later in the year because this match is only available for this campaign. It's also a really great marketing tool. It's um, language that you can include in your email or social media efforts. Um, it's also something if you are running a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign, this is really great messaging that you can provide to your participants so that they can motivate their network of people to make a donation. Um, so if they're reaching out to their colleagues or their family or friends, a match is going to be available at this time so your donation can make an even larger impact. Um, and of course, a match uh, is goal-oriented. So matching grants can help you reach your fundraising goals by bringing people to your nonprofit to donate when you need them, um, you know, as opposed to someone, again, waiting until the end of the year or giving Tuesday to make a donation. If you set up a match now, it motivates them to make their donation now as opposed to later. So there are various types of matching grants. One-to-one -one is the most common match. So that means that if someone makes a $5 donation, their donation is matched by $5. So it's really a $10 donation. Uh, you can go more creative with your matches if you want to, you could do a percentage match. So instead of a one-to-one, -one, if it's a portion of a donation, you can do that or you can have it set to be a cum cumulative threshold match, which means that maybe you want it to be a match where if you receive 50 donations, you receive $1,000. Or if you receive 30 donors, you receive $500. So there's a lot of different matches that are available that you can utilize to your advantage. So a matching grant is also a really great opportunity to be an icebreaker with new or prospective sponsors. Um, so a matching grant provides you a different approach as to how uh, someone in your community or network or sponsor can provide support to your organization instead of just writing a check. 
um, providing a match can actually from some sponsors be more meaningful because again, they're all, they also know that their match is going to motivate and incentivize donors to give as well. And as well, matching grants provide sponsors the ability to be recognized for their philanthropy and build their reputation for giving back. On the Mighty Cause platform, you have the ability to add a logo to a matching grant. So if there's a sponsor, if there is a local um, group or association, company, local business that you're working with, they can add their logo to the match and share that with their community that they're providing that to your organization. So who provides a matching grant? Uh, board members are actually a really common um, uh, group of people that can provide a uh, matching grant. This could be one individual board member, but as well boards can pull their funds together and provide a board member match. Um, so this is definitely one group of people that you can reach out to. Um, major gift donors. Uh, so if there is a donor who donates typically in large amounts, but you want to, again, provide them a different ask, instead of just asking them to make another large donation, providing them, asking them to provide a match is a different way that they can uh, work with your organization or provide support to, for your organization. Sponsors, as we just talked about, are, are also a really great way. Uh, are a really great resource for providing a matching grant. And also anyone, you know, there's no limit to who can provide a match. It can be anyone in your orbit, um, anyone who is just generous enough to provide a match. And a match doesn't have to be an extravagant amount, doesn't have to be $5,000. Uh, really the goal is that it incentivizes donors, it provides urgency. So it can be, you know, $500. It doesn't have to be something that is in the thousands of dollars. So the world is your oyster as to who and what type of match you want to create. So some matching grant strategies that you can utilize for your spring fundraising campaign. So it's a great way to kick off your campaign. Um, so as I mentioned, kind of with messaging, a match is a really great marketing tool. So it's a really great way to start off your campaign. Um, and also same thing, it's a really great way to end a campaign for the final day or final hours of your campaign. It's really great to introduce a match to motivate people to donate during that last time period. And if you are planning an in-person event or virtual event or a live stream, this is also a really great opportunity, again, to kind of create that engagement. There's a match going on during a live stream or during an event, and you have text to give going on. There's going to be a lot of people who can easily make a donation or feel motivated to make a donation. You can also map a match around a leaderboard challenge. We talked a few slides back about different challenges that you can create. So you can think about the different types of matches you can map around um, what leaderboards uh, or challenges that you want to have. So if you are planning on doing a leaderboard for most unique donors or most unique or most dollars raised, then you can create a match around that as well um, for that time period. And I think it's in general important when you think about the type of strategy you want to implement is what is your overall match goal? So is it donor acquisition? Are you looking for more donors, more new donors, or is it donor engagement? Um, if it's donor acquisition, you may want to consider use a matching grant that is based on bringing on in a certain number of unique donors. If it's donor engagement, maybe you want to set your match to kick in when you've received a certain number of donations. Um, so some things to think about um, once you're kind of mapping out what is your overall goal for your campaign and what you want to accomplish with a match. So when it comes to your match, you definitely want to utilize this opportunity to market it. So you want to make sure that you're sending this out to emails, make sure to include information about this um, to your donor so that they can plan to make their gift using that string imagery to emphasize that a match can be a really great time um, to, again, make their donation grow. Uh, 
add it to your website so that if a donor does come onto your website, they also see that you will have a match available or when your match is available that it currently is available and that can motivate donors to make a larger donation on social media, adding it to social media, announcing it before it goes live and also announcing it when it's available. And if you are doing an in-person event, maybe having a printed materials available that shares maybe a sign or poster that there is a match that's currently live. And if someone makes a donation now, their donation is gonna make a larger impact. If you are planning a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaign where you are gonna have participants, it's really helpful to create a mini toolkit uh, that includes some of this social media and email marketing. You don't have to go you know, outside of the box and create something that um, a lot of additional work for yourself. If you're already creating email and social media posts for your own organization, you just wanna transfer that, um, adjust the language a bit and have that available for participants so that they don't have any excuse to not share it on social media or send it out in an email. It's really easy for them to do so. Um, and again, and it just helps their own fundraising pages as well. All right, so I'm gonna leave the rest of the time for questions. Um, so as I mentioned, there is a Q&A uh, box in your Zoom panel. So if you want to go ahead and put in your questions there. Oops. One second. All right, so let's look at um, some of the questions. Can you list the names of your matching donors on your page? Uh, so uh, I guess it depends on um, matching donors. So if you're referring to like the, the individuals, the uh, grantors who are providing the matches, yes. So on Mighty Cause, when you create a match, um, you will be able to add their name as well to it. And that will be listed at the bottom of your fundraising page or your organization page, wherever you're creating or wherever you're, um, whatever you're utilizing for your fundraising. Um, so their name will be listed there. And as well, if you do wanna create a different section, there are custom tabs available. If you want to maybe add a bio about the grantor, um, you can definitely do so, but that will automatically be available if you use the matching grants tool on Mighty Cause. Any advice about linking such a fundraising event to the organization's anniversary? anniversary? Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can incorporate your, a fundraising event to your organization's anniversary. Maybe you wanna make it a birthday party for your organization and that's the theme of your fundraising event. Um, it can be dependent on also the type of organization you are, but that's just one idea of how you can add a theme to your event, make it fun and still incorporate that organization anniversary. And then maybe in your um, donation levels or descriptions or the story that you're sharing with your donors for your spring fundraising campaign, you're sharing the story of your organization, maybe add a timeline of you know, how your organization has grown through the years and what you're looking to do in the future. Uh, if you have a specific day to donate, can you have multiple grants based on specific needs? Um, so if you have a specific day to donate, yes, you can have multiple, ma multiple matching grants, different types of matching grants happening at the same time, happening one after the other. Um, based on specific needs, that's a little bit dependent on what exactly you're referring to. Um, potentially, yes, maybe no. It just depends on the details of what you mean by specific needs. Um, a matching grant would be, um, you can apply them to an overall team and event. You can apply them if you're not running a team or event. If you're just having a fundraising page, you can apply it just on a fundraising page. Um, but it would be towards all donors, you can set some sort of conditions if you want it to be only for donations over a specific amount. Um, 
but yeah, it just kind of depends on the details. Is there a separate fee for text to give? Do people have to opt into it? Yes, yeah, so text to give on our platform is only available on our advanced plan. We do have a trial that you can set up if you're interested in testing it out and seeing if you're interested in that. Um, you can set up a trial. You can contact us as well um, on our, uh, you can contact our support team. Um, so support at mightycost.com. And we can also get you in touch with someone who can break down the advance plan or break down text to give even more if that's something that you're interested in. Um, if you do sign up for the advance plan, um, there is a limit for I think 200 texts, but I haven't seen an organization reach that limit before. So um, as long as you're within the 200 texts, then it's, it's just included in the advance plan. Um, okay, so there are a couple of other questions coming in through the chat. Um, can we post the live stream on the main fundraising campaign page? Uh, yes. So depending on what you're referencing, main fundraising campaign page, uh, it, 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 may, it may be in a different area than other pages. So if you're using an organization page or an organization profile, you can add that to your about section, or you can create a custom tab and add that to your about section. If you're just using kind of our standard individual fundraising pages, you can set that up as a cover image or in your description. But regardless, whatever page you use, you can add that to your page. Um, do people have to opt in for text to give? So text to give would be uh, for donors to text a keyword and receive a link to donate. So they don't have to opt in by making the text, they are opting in to receive a message to make a donation. Um, do, uh, I think just an additional question, uh, do they need to opt in text to give like they do for emails? Uh, no, because after they make that the, the text to receive a message, um, we no longer message them. Um, I believe if they don't make a donation through that link within 24 hours, we send one reminder text to them afterwards, just a general reminder. Uh, but otherwise, um, there, we no longer message them or, or store their information to provide them more communication. Their phone numbers are available to you. So you can see who has uh, utilized that text number, who has made a donation from the text number. So, you know, you can utilize that information um, however you want to. Um, and you can also see if you are want to test it out, you can see how effective that is. If that's something that you think you really need to implement further in your event, you can track that, as I mentioned. And um, that's a really great way to see if that's something that you want to continue to incorporate. Are there any other questions coming through? Uh, I don't think so. So this slide deck and uh, a recording of this webinar will be available uh, to all of you. We'll send it out in an email so um, you'll have access to it. If you have any further questions, please uh, feel free to contact us um, on our to our support. We're more than happy to help clarify or. Um, again, provide any additional resources that we can. Text to, so sorry, one question before we go, text to give, can it be ongoing? Uh, yeah, and you can set up multiple texts to give, or uh, keywords, I should say. So if you wanna have one that is just a general one for your organization, and then if you wanna set up one for a specific event that you're having, um, you can set up two different keywords. Um, so it could be, you know, if you're, Let's say if your organization is MCF and your keyword can be M MCF and then your keyword for your event is M MCF 2022. Um, so you can uh, have one that's continuous or one to close out. Um, okay, don't see any other questions coming in, but if there are any further questions, again, please feel free to ask us. We're more than happy to help provide any insight that we can. And as well, if you have any feedback as to different topics, uh, different you know, 
areas of fundraising that you think would be really helpful, please let us know. We're always looking to hear from organizations to hear what's most important for you. What are you interested in learning about? Um, so yes, please let us know as well. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate your time. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.